Leo. Thank you very, very, very much. In 1975, having been an assistant pastor for almost two years, I knew that God wanted me to become a pastor. I had got to preach at three churches that were interested in calling me, potentially. One was the Ventura Baptist Church in Holland, Michigan. It had a nice building, beautiful tri-level parsonage surrounded by pine trees about a mile and a half from Lake Michigan. The second building was the church, was the Northland Baptist Church in Ossinique, Michigan, right across US 23 from the uh, Lake Huron. And they had a nice building, said, if you come here, you can get a mortgage, we'll help you, you can buy your own house. And then it came to the First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. And we knew we'd be preaching here. Christy and I drove up from Mount Morris, Flint area, where we were serving then, just to look at the building. We didn't know where it was. We knew it was on Dixie Highway. We stopped at the state police post, which was then in existence, and said, hey, do you know where First Baptist Church of Bridgeport is? And they did not. And one of them said, hey, Rudy, you go to that church. Where is it? Greg Holmquist was known at the state police as Rudy. And when I realized somebody from the church was going to come give us directions, we went around the corner so that he wouldn't see us. And he told us it was on the same road, on the same side of the road, down the road less than two miles. That's the high profile First Baptist Church of Bridgeport had in the community at that time. We looked in the house and there was no bathtub there. Wasn't a big deal to me, but Chrissy likes to take a bath every couple of months. Her cigarette burns and the carpet where transients had stayed overnight. We looked at the buildings that had been motel buildings when Dixie Highway was the main way up north before I-75 was constructed and saw chunks of drywall falling off of the walls and space heaters surrounded by chicken wire so the kids wouldn't burn themselves when they came in there. And I remember thinking, how am I ever going to get anybody to come to this church? I wouldn't come here if I wasn't the pastor. And you called us. It was the day the church was to vote on us. I was the assistant at Colonial Hills Baptist Church in Mount Morris, sitting in the office, knowing that that evening the vote was to take place. And I wrote down some goals for the church. One of those was to try to get on the radio. I remember reading about somebody who went on the radio the first week they started their church. And so I called Family Life Radio, and I said, uh, this is Renee Ouellette from Colonial Hills Baptist Church. But I thought I don't want them to think I'm calling for them. I said, I expect soon to be the pastor of First Baptist Church in Bridgeport. I wanted to see how much it costs to be on the radio. They said, just a moment, we'll transfer your call. Not five minutes after I hung up, the phone rang. Elsie Britt called. She and her husband worked with us in the youth group and were the only people in the church besides the pastor that knew we were thinking about leaving. And she said, is this Pastor Willette from Colonial Hills Baptist Church who expects you to be the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Bridgeport? I thought that was strange. I said, yes. She said, don't you know what you just did? I said, no. She said, you called during bargain counter. That went out over the air. Another couple was working with us in the youth group, Sid and Winnie Jackson. They did not know that we were leaving. He was working in the shop and had the radio on. He heard my voice. He said, shh, that's my pastor. He expects him to be pastor of the First Baptist Church in Bridgeport. People in Bridgeport heard it. They had not voted yet. But I went on the air to announce that I had won. Eighteen people voted. Six of them, as I am told, by absentee ballot. They'd never been to church on a Wednesday night, had no intention of going to church on a Wednesday night, have not yet attended, as far as I know, church on a Wednesday night. And all 18 of them kindly and graciously extended us a call. And God was really, really good. I told the story the other night. Some of you weren't here. I was in the house, the house that uh, you'd fixed up as nicely as you could for us to live in, moving things around for Chrissy, and there was a knock on the door. It was Thursday. I was to start on Sunday, and an old man named Fred Arndt, he was 62 years old, said, hey, preacher, you going soul winning with us tonight? I said, sure. So I threw a suit on, went into the office, rummaged around, found old visitor cards, years old, Looked until I saw some that I knew where the streets were. 
And I went and knocked on a door over in Genesee Gardens. A man named Gary Partlow answered the door. He and his wife and three teenage children trusted Christ as their Savior that night. And our first Sunday here, they walked down the aisle to make a profession of faith in Christ. That afternoon, that old man, Fred Arndt, took us out to lunch at Sullivan's, one of the many now defunct restaurants and businesses in Saginaw, but just down Dixie Highway a little bit. And we met Pastor and Mrs. Rick and Tony Flanders. They were there eating. They pastored Junior at a Baptist church. He was so encouraging. Oh, he said, I'm glad somebody's come to Saginaw. That town has bus written all over it. And he'll tell the story and say that that was the beginning, those five people down the aisle, of a long parade of souls that God has given us at this church. We started construction on our first building in 1977, or 76, completed it in 77. In 1978, we felt impressed to the Lord to start the Bridgeport Baptist Academy. I thought we had a building to rent, but the deal fell through at the last minute, and so we were looking to build, and it was already summer. Prices came in extremely high, about 30% higher than we expected and thought we could afford. And in the kindness and grace of God, we were able to construct a metal building. We started construction June 19th and occupied the building September 19th, 60 days later. A lot of people told us not to do it and told us all the troubles we had, but God was in it and God was good. And you saw in the video some of the histories. The court case with the state of Michigan cost us $250,000. God's people from around the state and around the country helped to raise that. That would be, I looked it up, $635,000 in today's dollars. 1984, we began to build the auditorium in our high school building, and then we built this building, turned that auditorium into our chapel in our high school, and extended the gymnasium. God's been really, really good to us, but the blessing of God is not mainly in buildings or budgets or battles. It's in the brethren. It's in the people. Uh, you have been very, very kind to us You've loved us, you've prayed for us, you've supported us, you've been generous to us. You've followed my leadership, forgiven my mistakes beginning before I even became pastor. Been faithful in your service. And no pastor's ever had a better group of people to serve or with whom to serve. Your thank yous have been really special and touching as we've come to the end of our time here as pastor and wife. But it is we who should be thanking you. Thank you for your labor. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your loyalty. Thank you for making this a good place to raise our children. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, the Bible says in verse 22, The Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy days approach that thou must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation that I may give him a charge. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. Verse 22, Moses therefore wrote this song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. That's pretty impressive. He wrote the song and he taught it to the children of Israel on one day. And he gave Joshua, the son of Nun, a charge and said, Be strong and of a good courage. For thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear unto them and I will be with thee. And so I have a final charge to the First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. I charge you. That's a good word. Uh, that word is used 494 times in the King James Bible. Matthew Henry, commenting on the word charge used in the book of Leviticus, said, we shall, every one of us, have a charge to keep, an eternal God to glorify, an immortal soul to provide for, our generation to serve, and it must be our daily care to keep this charge. For it is the charge of our Lord and Master who will shortly call us to an account about it. And it is our utmost peril if we neglect it. That was in 1708. About 1762 or so, Wesley wrote, Charles Wesley, a charge to keep I have. He'd read the commentary by Henry. A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never-dying soul to save and fit it for the sky. 
to serve the present age, my calling to fulfill. Oh, may it all my powers engage to do my master's will. I charge the First Baptist Church of Bridgeport to be faithful. The Bible says it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Be in your place. Be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Be on your bus route. Be teaching your class. Be involved in the ministry of the Lord Jesus. It is not required in stewards that a man be found forward-looking. It is not required in stewards that a man be found fashionable. It is not required in stewards that a man be found flashy. But it is required for us as stewards of the Lord Jesus to be faithful. If I hear that the attendance tails off and people are quitting their classes and folks are not serving on their bus route and people aren't going soul winning, I will feel that I have been a failure as a pastor of the First Baptist Church. Then be followers. Paul said, be followers of me even as I also am of Christ. I did not ask you to follow me because of me, but because of the position God had given me. And it was it's going to be every bit as biblically your responsibility to follow Pastor Howell as it has been to follow me. Pastor Howell asked you to do some things differently. He's already stepped on the third rail of independent Baptist polity and asked you to change where you sit during a service. I'm surprised you didn't vote him out before he became pastor. He may do some things differently. He may change the time of the services. He may change the design and the decor of the building. He may even have two deacons meetings one or two times in the same year. Follow him. And then I charge you to be fervent. I'm always mindful of what the Bible tells us the Lord's message was to the church at Ephesus. Ephesus was a good church. They took a good stand. They knew who false prophets were and they exposed them. They worked hard. Their work was described as labor. And as they went on in their ministry, their labor increased. The last to be more than the first. But the message to the church at Ephesus didn't conclude with that commendation. It concluded with a condemnation. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because you have left your first love. Be fervent. The church at Ephesus lost their edge. Stay involved, stay invested, stay intense. I want to come back and meet the new people you've led to Christ. I want to come back to a service and greet your visitors. I want to come back and sense the buzz of expectancy that says something's going to happen in the service today. 